Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello. I wonder if you could help me. I am interested in enrolling in your MBA programme. Could you give me some information, please? Yes, of course. I'll take a few details first of all, and I'll give you a copy of our prospectus. Oh, that's OK. I already have one here. I've been researching the MBA courses in the local area, so I already have lots of course information. That's great. OK, so first of all, can you tell me your name, please? Yes, of course. It's Anne Horbury. Horbury. Is that H-A-W-B-E-R-R-Y? Yes, that's right. OK, and what's your date of birth, Ms Horbury? The 22nd of May, 1981. That's great. And you were born in the UK? Yes, I was. All right, can you give me some contact details, please? Sure. My address is 26 Simon Place in Brighton and my telephone number is 01903 714 721. Sorry, can you tell me your contact number once again? Yes, it's 01903 714 721. Okay, great. And do you have a mobile phone number? No, I don't. Is it important? No, that's OK. I'll just write it on your form, no mobile phone. Now, just a few additional questions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Are you working or studying anywhere else at the moment? Yes, I'm working for Lloyd Enterprise in the city as a secretary and I'm also attending a computer course part-time in the evenings. Great. So can you give me some details about your educational background? We need to make sure that your qualifications match the entry requirements. Yes. I completed a business degree a year ago. I've been working since my graduation, but the job market is very competitive these days, so I'd like to do some postgraduate study now. OK, that sounds fine. Your degree is relevant, and it's good that you have some work experience too. I do need to warn you, though, that our MBA programme is extremely popular and gets full quickly. So would you be interested in applying for any alternative courses if your application is not successful this time? Well, my first choice would, of course, be the MBA. But yes, I've had a good look through your prospectus and I would also be interested in the international marketing course. That's great. It's always a good idea to keep your options open just in case. Finally, can you tell me where you learned about our courses here? Actually, my cousin studied the MBA course two years ago, and she recommended it to me. OK, well, thank you for coming in today. I will pass your details on to our admissions department. They should contact you this week with a formal application form, and they usually invite MBA candidates to come in for an interview. OK, well, thanks for your time. No problem. Good luck with your application. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given by an international student. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. As an international student coming from Sierra Leone, it gives me great honor to give these opening remarks and welcome you all to Ashisi University, where excellence is the code. I believe I speak on behalf of my fellow colleagues when I say we feel that we are the most fortunate and privileged university students in Ghana. You may ask, what is the basis of such a conclusion? And I will simply say to you, in which other tertiary institution in Ghana do you find the same level of IT infrastructure and facilities available to students? Where also do you find such a low ratio of students to lecturers and computers? In which other educational institution do you find 55% of students on some sort of financial aid who in addition enjoy services and benefits such as job placement after graduation, on-campus employment that pays above the minimum wage, a supply of textbooks, and access to online databases. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no other institution of higher education in Ghana today that matches the learning environment and the quality of instruction at Ashisi. I could continue listing reasons why we students feel this way, but I only have five minutes for this speech. Believe me, I could go on for hours. At Ashisi, everyone is considered a leader and is treated special. Ashisi equips us with the necessary determination, strength, and belief in ourselves to be able to achieve our goals. We are being taught to think outside the box and to question and challenge our assumptions about the world we live in. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the benefits of a liberal arts education, which seeks to broaden our intellectual capacity. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. At Ashisi, we are also exposed to real-life situations and learn how to deal with them through a practical and vigorous academic program, as well as various seminars in which prominent leaders in their professions are invited as guests to interact and share their knowledge and experiences. Some people, even some of you in this audience, may believe that tuition at Ashisi is too high. But I say to you that the students here are unanimous in saying it is worth it. Not because we all come from well-to-do families, but because when it comes to one's education, you need to aim at getting the best from the right place. One's education defines who you are and what your perception of life and society will become. Ashisi offers us a top-quality education which meets high international standards. This is due to the strong linkages the school has established with three of the very best schools in the United States, namely Swarthmore College, which is ranked as the best liberal arts school in the U.S., UC Berkeley, and the University of Washington. In addition, Ashisi has recruited an excellent faculty consisting of lecturers from various countries, including Ghana, the U.K., and the United States. These lecturers are among the best in their respective academic fields. I believe this is the school's greatest asset, a strong and knowledgeable team dedicated to achieving successful results from their students and who also love their job. I would like to end with a personal message. My fellow students, because we are among the most privileged in our society, we should take responsibility for our own destinies, make our parents proud, 
and create a legacy for those that follow us and Africa as a whole. We must give back to our society after completing school and achieving our goals in life, which I believe we all can if we properly utilize our time and take advantage of all that is offered here at Ashisi. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and Scott. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Howdy, what can I do for you? I'm here to ship some things back to China. OK, we can do that. Shipping things back, eh? Have you lived there before? Yeah, I lived there for three years and came back two years ago. Now I'm going back to start my own business. Really? Did you ship things with us last time? No, I used a Chinese shipping agency. Well, I'll just let you know that rates have changed recently, so I don't know if they'll be comparable to what you pay before. It doesn't matter to me. My company's paying for it. Aha! Uh -huh. Then it's nothing off your skin, right? OK. I'll need your name and where you need to go to pick up the items to be shipped. My name is Scott Linder, L-I-N-D-E-R, and I live in upstate New York, Saratoga Springs. Oh, sure. I know that place. I go to the races there. Great town. What's the zip there again? Double seven o four two five, and the street address is four one two West Lake Road. Double seven o four two five West Lake. Got it. And how big of a container are you going to be looking for? Well, I didn't have a container last time, and I don't think I'll need one this time. I think that I'll have about six cubic meters. We can get a subsection of a container then. How big is that? It's two meters wide and three meters long. Two metres high, right? Yes, sir. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And for customs, I need to know what sort of items will you be shipping? Mostly furniture. But we'll also have quite a few boxes of books too. Any clothing? Nope. But we'll have some bicycles and wood that we use for a loft bed. Be careful with those bicycles. I hear bicycle theft is a big problem in China. Not if you know how to secure your bikes and where to store them. Well, good luck. How valuable do you want me to list the entire shipment as being? Let's say about three and a half thousand dollars. Great. Now you'll also have to go over to the customs department to check with them about shipping the wood over to China. I know there are concerns about termites, bugs, etc. No problem. It's the same wood I brought over from China last time then you should be OK. It's just a formality. And last of all, where would you like the shipment to be delivered? Well, I will live in Beijing, but let's ship it to Tianjin. My company will pick it up there. 
That's all right then. Have a nice trip. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Lake Ackerman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire, and tsunami. The giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometers across, and travelling at around 90,000 kilometers an hour, slammed into an area of red volcanic rock. About 430 kilometers northwest of Adelaide, within seconds the meteorite vaporized in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometers deep and 40 kilometers in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 meter high tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometers away. Ancient, stable, and unglaciated. The bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman, surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps, forty kilometers across, and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the center of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern. That experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact, except for a crater which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges. More than 300 kilometers east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometers from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure: coarse pebbles at the bottom, 
then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand, distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea, hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Akraman, the arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.